and he's going to share with us his insight into innovative hardware. Please join me in welcoming Aaron. Hello, everyone. So thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. We're excited to be here. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's imagine what the internet is going to be like in 10 years. But first, who the hell am I? Um, I co-founded Packet uh, in 2014. Um, I initially directed the product development and architecture there. And now I work primarily on open source and partner integrations. Um, and I still lay down code, uh, mostly Python and Go. Um, I've written several of our integrations, like our Terraform drivers and libcloud integration and various other uh, ecosystem drivers. Uh, in a previous life before Packet, uh, I was a political uh, tech junkie. I worked on two failed presidential campaigns. Um, I was a hardware hacker, web developer, and systems administrator. Um, I've been running various distributions of Linux for quite a while now. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of a retrospective of the last 10 years. Um, so I thought this was an interesting sort of point is, yeah, I bought my first stick of RAM, which is a four megabyte stick for $144 in 1995. So, so what's Packet? Uh, we're relatively new on the scene, um, but we're basically a bare metal cloud platform. So it's a, a fully dedicated servers on demand over an API. Um, we're backed by SoftBank and Dell. Um, we have 11,000 users from SaaS startups to Fortune 50s. Uh, we have 50 locations globally. Um, and we do about 50,000 deploys a month, uh, all taking place in less than eight minutes. So that's a fully bare metal server, no hypervisor, no virtualization, um, full provision lifecycle in about eight minutes. And we offer both x86 and uh, ARM v8 uh, servers by the hour. Um, you can deploy them in four different ways. We do it on demand, which is our public cloud. You can just go sign up there today and, uh, and do it. Um, we have reserved instances, we have a spot market, and we also do private deployment. So fundamentally, it's, uh, it's hardware at the end of an API. Um, and we started Packet because we had a deep passion about the physical infrastructure uh, behind the internet. Um, we believe in the disruptive power of software and open source. Um, and we think that um, software is eating its way down the infrastructure stack a little bit counterintuitively um, than most people feel. but. Um, we felt like, especially with the rapid adoption of uh, containers in the broader software development community, um, that was bringing a level of portability that the cloud had always sort of promised but was never really delivered on, especially with the big virtual public clouds out there. So we focus on automating fundamental infrastructure. Um, and we bring that automation with uh, as few opinions as possible. So no hypervisor, no virtualization, no co-tenancy, just the bare bones. Um, you're obviously free to bring your own hypervisor and do whatever you want from there. So this is fundamentally what we set out to do, uh, was to build a better internet. And so that sort of leads us to the question, what will the infrastructure of tomorrow look like? But first, like predicting the future is really hard. Uh, we don't really know in five or 10 years. Um, will it be the same, will it be different? And so to give us a fighting chance, we're gonna go back to the future about 10 years ago and give you a little rundown. So the iPhone was two months old 10 years ago. Pretty much everyone was on BlackBerry. I was slinging this guy. Um, uh, AWS was just 18 months old. So uh, the EBS hadn't launched yet. Um, this was a time when, really, this was one of the first times that software engineers could just get a, a, a VM more or less instantly. And they, when they launched it, the AWS engineers still considered this essentially utility and didn't ha weren't even thinking about using persistent storage yet. So this was like groundbreaking new stuff and, and somewhat confusing, honestly, to a lot of uh, uh, traditional web developers. Luckily, a lot of things stay the same. This is what Reddit literally looked like in 2007, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Some things are no longer with us. Um, yeah, there was no Uber. So Uber was still two years away. And um, in, the, in the initial uh, presentation of the day, you saw that other long list of things that didn't, didn't exist. Um, so it's pretty crazy how far we've come in, in 10 years. So what's next? Um, in our opinion, the infrastructure of tomorrow will be defined by specialization. Um, the change is going to continue to accelerate. It's going to be even more rapid than the last 10 years. 
the velocity of software is going to be the main driver of that. Um, you know, the the number of software developers uh, working is is growing faster and faster, um, and they are just pounding out a lot of code. And hardware is going to be the next innovation layer because of that. But the only way that that's going to happen is if we're able to get the hardware in the hands of those developers. So I think we're going to see that faster faster adoption um, in the next 10 years, uh, mainly being fueled by that software development. Um, but, and this is one of the reasons that we founded a bare metal cloud in 2014, when essentially, you know, in many people's minds, the cloud war had been won, um, is that uh, software is hitting the limits of the virtual public clouds. Um, people grapple with expensive compute that is inflexible, it's inconsistent, um, and they're doing a lot of acrobatics on the software side to kind of deal with that. Um, and as we get to, you know, uh, sort of Moore's law limit on thread speed, people are going to be, are, are already looking at how to offload specific um, workloads. Um, you see people looking for GPUs in the cloud. You see people looking for SSL offload in their network cards. Um, so I think we're going to see a shift from abstract compute and blobby resources in the cloud are good enough to I really need to start to target my application workloads to specific um, hardware. And I think that there are three areas that are going to be particularly dependent on specialized hardware. Um, I think virtual reality and gaming is one that we're already seeing uh, without question. Um, Internet of Things is still a wild, wild west. There's not a whole lot of best practices there, and the, the demands and requirements there are so much different than what the cloud generally you know, gives you out of the box. Um, and autonomous hardware, um, driving cars, uh, drones, uh, your refrigerator may deliver beer to you in the middle of the night, who knows? Um, and so let me give you an analogy, right? So in 10 years, if there's 25,000 self-driving cars in New York City, those, the, the, the software that's driving those cars is not going to be in Virginia for a variety of reasons. Um, Latency is going to be an, an issue. Um, regulations likely will uh, affect that. Um, efficiency and power. Um, security. Um, and uh, so you're going to see hardware that needs to be specialized and local, um, which currently doesn't exist. So, um, as I said, you know, rapidly Moore's Law isn't becoming the most important metric that we're going to measure things by. Um, you know, workloads have, became, have become much more efficient and portable. Again, especially with, with containers, now you have the ability to truly be multi-cloud. You can deploy on specialized hardware in your on-site uh, data center on-premise while also deploying other workload to multiple different cloud providers. Um, and we're, we're seeing that on Packet. We have a lot of people that are deploying very specific um, workload for their application on our dedicated bare metal while then delivering various payload to the entire Amazon ecosystem. So this is the direction that the entire, basically I would say, you know, at scale cloud workload is going. Um, and uh, especially with microservices and, and now hosted ser serverless Lambda functions, um, the ability to you know, target very, very specific pieces of your application and workload of your application to a very, very specific piece of hardware location profile is now possible where it wasn't possible before. Um, so we need to think about developing the next wave of infrastructure innovation a little bit differently than the last. So AWS and the virtualized public cloud is, was, in my opinion, the last sort of innovation. Um, it, it provided infrastructure uh, on demand easily at the fingertips of a, an entire generation of software developers. Um, the next generation of software developers is going to have to get closer to the hardware. So there's six words that I would describe and we kind of talk about at Packet as being that, that next generation of infrastructure, uh, specifically as it relates to the cloud and the internet. Um, so it's automated. It's fully automated. Um, one of the biggest uh, differentiators between us and a traditional dedicated rack and stack web host is that you can hit an API and get a server in a few minutes. 
And that's table stakes now for, for modern web development and application developers. Um, if it doesn't work with Ansible, if it doesn't work with Terraform, if I can't get an API library and hit an API and get the resources that I need and fully program against it, it's not viable. It needs to be distributed. Uh, this you know, may be obvious to some, um, but uh, I think the, um, there will always be a place for these sort of mega data centers and sort of uh, gigantic regions in one specific place. Um, but especially, especially uh, you know, latency um, uh, applications with low latency requirements and, um, and the like need to have more compute out at the edge. So we've done a good job at distributing um, edge content, but that's not the same as compute on the edge. Again, uh, it's specialized. So I think you're gonna see more and more um, people that are utilizing um, specific uh, offloads in the hardware itself. So SSL offload in you know, network cards to um, GPUs to um, TPM chips. Uh, you know, as these workloads become uh, more specialized, people are gonna be looking at you know, targeting specific workload to specific architectures. And that, the infrastructure needs to be primarily agnostic, so you can't, you can't assume that you're gonna bring a hypervisor. You can't assume you're gonna have network attached storage. You can't assume that the hardware only works in specific you know, conditions. Um, and we're, we're seeing this a lot uh, where people, because people are gonna be bringing their own, right? People, are, people and software developers are more and more assuming that they can orchestrate and bring their own virtualization or their own bare metal or whatever it is, and if uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the way, then they're not gonna use it. And a lot of it's gonna be untrusted, so you know, the, you, you will likely be taking advantage of um, cloud resources and hardware that are in places that don't have a retina scanner and a man cage. You may be deploying compute and workload out into edge sites um, that you, you don't trust. Um, so a lot of that infrastructure is going to be untrusted, uh, and so that is a problem I think that the software engineers are gonna have to figure out how to um, securely and safely use these untrusted resources. And it's really gonna be dynamic, like the infrastructure is going to have to get more dynamic. I think the days of dropping you know, a hardware appliance in your data center uh, are, are going away. Um, we have, like I said, an entire generation of web developers and engineers who have grown up in a totally dynamic uh, environment and that have actually no, very little concept of what actually is happening back there. By back there, I mean in the data center. A lot of them haven't looked at a server. They don't know what it looks like. Um, they haven't even cracked open their laptops. So this is, I think, what generally describes what we're gonna see in this sort of next generation of infrastructure on the internet. So it sounds great, right? Uh, what could possibly stop us? It's a good question. And the answer is access and adoption. Uh, in my opinion, the, the only thing that's gonna prevent this sort of next infrastructure uh, disruption in the market are these two things. And the challenges with that is infrastructure is hard. It's hard to build. Um, it takes a long time. Um, dealing with the real world is, <laughs> is difficult. Um, and access to big hardware uh, is, is rare. And by access to big hardware, I mean you know, enter enterprise-grade ARM chips. Um, and, and the people I'm talking about giving access to are um, those you know, hundreds of thousands of people on GitHub that truly don't understand you know, the hardware. They're used to dealing with abstract you know, blobs of compute. Um, the, a lot of these folks don't even understand that a Raspberry Pi is a different architecture, right? I mean, this is kind of like, a, but this is a community that's driving all of the fundamental software that runs 90% you know, of the internet. Um, and yeah, most developers have never touched a server, a GPU, they don't understand that ARM is an architecture at all or that Intel is one. That it's, uh, we, have a, we have a gap there in terms of education um, and understanding. And a lot like, yeah, you can't change your oil in your car anymore. 
um, well, electric cars don't have oil anymore. Um, you're not, you don't crack open your phone, you don't really crack open your laptop, you know, de desktops are even going away. So the number of developers um, who have built their own PCs, for example, is, is uh, that number is getting fewer and fewer. And honestly, multi-architecture support is pretty poor uh, in the broader um, uh, software ecosystem. Um, compatibility is, you know, <laughs> is uh, its problem, um, and it, as, as long as that foundational software doesn't just work, CIOs and CTOs are not going to invest in even looking at or doing a POC on a different architecture than x86, um, and that's too bad. Um, and yeah, so no sane person is gonna do CI, CD, or much less production on a Raspberry Pi, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's basically a toy in that context. Um, <laughs> So what should we do about it? So in short, let's make firmware cool again. Um, you know, there you go, right? You got. We have to. We have to find a way to um, ignite that spark and that interest in this sort of generation of coders um, to show them that it is cool. It, it, it's fun. It's awesome. It's why I am doing what I'm doing. Um, but it, they've been uh, pushed so far away from it by the general trends that uh, they just don't know what they're missing, quite frankly. So it's not all bad news uh, in reality. Um, in fact, the interest in hardware is growing. Um, you know, Raspberry Pis, um, you know, the Internet of Things uh, wave. Uh, you know, when I look back to, you know, when I was wire wrapping shift registers uh, <laughs> to now, the, the ecosystem in terms of embedded devices and platforms, you know, from BeagleBone to Arduino to, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's more, it seems like, coming out every other day. The Onion, um, and then the Raspberry Pi, I mean, like, people love it. They just love it. You know, if you, if you find, look at all of the really interesting and fun um, projects that, are, that, that people are picking up that are just average coders um, and that are able to get into a full Linux environment with Wi-Fi on an embedded device is pretty cool. Um, so, so that's good, you know, I think people are uh, interested in it. There's just a long learning curve for, for a Python developer to learn how to, you know, program C. And we're already making good progress. Um, so Packet works with ARM on the Works on ARM program. Um, Ed Villamenti over here runs that program for us. He's gonna be talking a little later in the day. Um, there's a, uh, I asked him today to, for, a, for a good statistic, but um, uh, since uh, Docker released multi-architecture support, about 33% of the top 140 Docker projects um, supported ARM in about three weeks. Yeah? Um, and now basically, uh, you know, the Go programming language, which drives most, I would say, um, microservices nowadays, um, is essentially fully, su fully supports multi-architecture. So it's pretty easy now if you have written something in Go to have it work on ARM without too much porting pain. So that's great. Um, but we can do better. Uh, and, and really, in my opinion, and this is why I primarily at Packet focus on community outreach and partner integrations, um, because I really believe that you have to bridge that gap um, between the hardware communities uh, and that broader software community. Um, and you have to find a way to, yeah, excite the, that millennial developer, um, to give them an opportunity to touch the hardware, to play with it, to understand the power of it, um, and finding ways to get enterprise grade hardware and architecture other than 86, x86 in their hands. Um, we launched with uh, ARM and um, with a little bit of SoftBank's help the first um, you know, enterprise grade Cavium Thunder X chip on our cloud last October. Um, and that was, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, and uh, that was one of the, I think that was basically the first time that you could on demand in a few minutes sign up on a website and get, an, it was a 96 core box. Two Cavium uh, Thunder X chips in that box. Um, and the response from the software community was just incredible. Um, we had people coming from every project you can imagine, from kernel developers, Linux distributions, to you know, Node.js developers, who are like, you know, finally now I have a, an automated way to get access 
to ARM. So now I can plug it into my CI CD. Now I can get it into my production pipeline. Um, so that, so that, was, that was pretty fun. Um, but, you know, Cavium is just one in a, you know, much bigger ecosystem, and I think we need to do a better job, and we've been working with Qualcomm as well, and getting the, their uh, new board out to market as well. Um, so that's good, um, but, you know, we can do better. Um, and the other piece that um, is uh, maybe not so much on the radar, but we would like it to be, is the more that the hardware um, provides metadata about itself and what it's doing, to orchestration software like Kubernetes, the faster this adoption is gonna go. Because truly, um, these new orchestration platforms and this new orchestration software, uh, while still relatively new, puts a, a level of power and ability to consume infrastructure in the hands of developers unlike anything we have ever seen. I mean, they accidentally spend a lot of money, a lot of time. Um, by having Kubernetes go nuts. But that's ultimately the tool they're gonna use. So when I say that they're gonna, when you start to pick apart your application and you start targeting particular workload within your application to specific, to specific um, pieces of hardware in specific locations for specific reasons, that metadata that the hardware provides is what's gonna enable you to do that. Because you have to have that context in order for the software to be able to do that. So here's just some examples of things that, you're, that, the, that the software is gonna wanna know about in order to properly orchestrate uh, workload and microservices and Lambda functions for software developers that are working uh, in these multi-architecture environments. So we invite you to join us. Um, we, have, we work with a lot of you already. Um, I'd love to meet you if uh, we haven't and you would like to uh, come along for the ride. Um, and we have a little bit of an exciting announcement, so get ready. Um, we're actually putting together an event um, November 29th and 30th in Las Vegas, um, which occurs at the same time as another big conference um, hosted by another big cloud provider, um, actually right in the middle of their campus, um, which will give us an opportunity <laughs> to hopefully uh, educate a lot of the developers that are gonna be there for, for that conference. Um, about the culture, the craft, and the excitement of infrastructure. And so we're hoping that as many of you as can will join us there. Um, there's a little bit of a teaser at ifxproject.org. Um, and, uh, and that's that. So I'm Welch at packet.net if you have any questions. And I guess if we have time, I'm happy to answer some here as well. Thank you so much, Aaron. We really appreciate you coming here and sharing that with us today. <laughs> I think we're just short on time. <laughs>